professional, educated, sexy confidants. Welcome to another episode of Confidently Insecure, the podcast where we are absolutely sure we don't know everything. I am your host, Kelsey Dara, and this week I am so excited to introduce you to this week's guest. We had an audio issue a couple weeks ago. She was so gracious and kind enough to reschedule, get back on the pod. She is here. She is a public health educator, Oh, excuse me, public health professional, sex educator, and professor based in Philly, Pennsylvania, one of my favorite cities. She has worked in clinical research, health education, community health, and disease prevention. Oh my gosh. She's developed and taught various programs in schools, shelters, nonprofit organizations, and corporate settings. And she is the creator of Sex Redefined, which is a web series to amplify diverse voices as it redefines sexuality. This week's guest, Janelle Bryan. Thank you so much for being here. Listen, thank you for having me. And I need you to like follow me around and say that as I enter every room. I would be glad to. I've told other guests before that like I'll record their voicemail setting and be like, hello, you've reached (laughs) Janelle Bryan, public health educator. Yeah. (laughs) We'll get a little clip for you. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you again for being so gracious with your time with audio issues. The last time we recorded, you are just, oh, this is why Philly people are my favorite people because they're just cool. Ever, but I will take that. <laughs> people are scared of us. I was just like, I don't know why. Like, yes, we bite, but like, <laughs> it's more like a nibble and less of, like less of a bite. I don't know. But. It's like a sexy nibble. <laughs> flirtatious it's so funny I I had two girls on the podcast this morning uh they they are shrink chicks they're therapists based out of Philly and we had the exact same conversation they were like (laughs) no one ever talks about how much they love Philly and I'm like cheese steaks ice water cute city that you could bicycle around in cool people like (laughs) I love it there if I could move there I totally would it's um it's its own aura you know it is. We're, we're a vibe. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. <laughs> you guys are your own. You just stand alone. I'm obsessed, but tell me what's like the sex education, like in Philly. <laughs> Ooh, um, <laughs> diving well, I mean, right in, <laughs> right in. I mean, what's the sex education like in, um, the U S like mm. primarily I got my start teaching teenagers. So I was never in schools. They do have a sex ed program in school, but I heard it's like the bare minimum. Yeah. So I was an after school teacher. I started with the Red Cross and I would go into like high schools and do sex ed and like, you know, after school program. And it was fun, but we didn't reach as many people as we wanted to, or we thought that we were, because also we're an after school program for mm-hmm. high schoolers. No one wants to stay after school and like chat with me about condoms. I mean, <laughs> I think I'm cool. Yeah, I still think like a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, I mean, I'm part of some of the states in the U.S. where you know about the same, better than some, but we're okay. Let me say that we're okay. We're do- we're doing our best with what we've been given, right? <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember having a sex educator on in the very early days of the podcast. This mm-hmm. was like three years ago. And she said something like the majority of school programs teach abstinence instead yes. of actual, like, I don't know, real shit kids are doing <laughs> at that age. I mean, do you feel like that's a huge problem we have here? Yeah, like definitely in the U.S. there's no regulated sex ed. So every mm. school can teach. I mean, every state can teach what they want. Mm. Right. So some is like abstinence only. I have friends that live in Texas and she says she cannot bring condoms onto school grounds. So I was like, how do you teach the, you know, students to put on condoms like without a condom? And she was like, she cannot bring a condom onto school property. So I'm saying we're better than some, but like the U S as a whole is lacking. And we really need to, you know, talk about sex ed, especially from a younger age, like people think like a sex ed class, it should be classes. It should mm. be, it's health. The way we talk about health at every stage, like health and wellness, sex is health and wellness. So we should keep, you know, keep that same energy. Mm. I feel mm. like when I think about my sex ed in sixth grade, we had like a hygiene class. Yes. You know, <laughs> I remember. Yeah. Like we were, you know, sixth, seventh grade, you get a little ripe and the teachers were kind of sick of us. So we had like 
this is deodorant. Please wear it for our <laughs> sakes. So, yeah, like, They're like, y'all are getting hormones and you stink. <laughs> you stink and we're stuck in a, like school with you. So please wear this. And then I had it again in like high school when it's just like gonorrhea, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's like my deodorant to gonorrhea. <laughs> right? I was just like, there's no middle ground. Like, no. I feel like even then, I was just like, I don't know a lot, but I feel like we missed a step. And, you know. <laughs> just a small bit of information. I remember right. I went to school in the South. I grew up in Florida. So I'm sure we fall somewhere in the realm of Texas sex. <laughs> I remember one day in exactly sixth or seventh grade where they split the boys and the girl. They were like, gender is two things. You will go this room or that room and you will learn about the parts you have and no questions, no talking, no giggling. And it was like the teacher's worst freaking nightmare to do that day. They were like, we signed up to be teachers, not sex <laughs> educators. So tell me like what possesses someone to want to go teach teens about sex oh my gosh like don't do my teens like that <laughs> out of all the people because there's like lipstick on my teeth I'm, sorry. I'm not gonna one second, one no, second. Yes, yes. <laughs> listen we support the movement to make sure our lipstick is in all the right places at all the right times we laugh here, we giggle here. Sometimes we get a little transference on the teeth. And I don't know if y'all have ever heard about the trick where you can put your finger in your mouth and you make like an O shape, uh, pull your finger out. And then that's supposed to get all the lipstick off of the places that it could potentially be on your teeth. I just okay. gave a little tutorial about getting lipstick off of your teeth <laughs> while you were gone. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, I caught my reflection. Okay, we're back. We're back. Uh, yes, but my teens are lovely. And I say my teens because like out of all the people that I've taught, and I've taught adults, I taught, I think the last year I taught the youngest was like five. Wow. Right. And that was, it was like sex ed. It was more so like consent, like what that looks like from a young age and not just what we're talking about in the, you know, in the context of sex, but like Sometimes you don't want people touching you and that is okay. Yeah. Yeah. But um, teenagers are, hmm, they're hmm. great, right? They scare me. <laughs> I mean, you should be a little scared. <laughs> I'm terrified of them because I know what I was doing at their age. So I'm like, oh my God. No. <laughs> yeah. But like when you're teaching, they pretend like they're not listening. They will really like have their back to you. They're rolling their eyes, you know, I feel like put away your phones. But in public health, one way that we test to see if people have retained health information is like, if you can teach it to someone else, that means mm. you really know your stuff. Mm. So like, I'll teach them and I'll make them be like, all right, teach me what I taught you. Mm. And then they We'll start like saying what I said and like in their own way. For sure. Just, right. But like you're listening. You're not gonna you're not gonna give me the satisfaction of letting of me know that you're listening. Cause that's that's too much. Okay. No, that's not cool. <laughs> it's not cool to to soak in information about your sexual wellness at a teenage <laughs> age. It's, it, but I, it's the arguably the most, to me, I would think mm -hmm. the most important age to learn about these uh, lifestyle choices that can have an effect on the rest of your freaking life. Like I have no problem. I've said this a million times on the podcast. I got chlamydia after the second person I ever slept with when I was 15 and mm -hmm. it fucked me up. Cause I was like, I'm going to die. No one's ever going to want to sleep with me. I'm dirty. I had all this like shame mm -hmm. around the, the health around sex that that's the age arguably and you tell me if you feel the same way that that's mm -hmm. the most important time to be learning these decisions maybe even earlier yes and like shame really lives and grows in you know not having knowledge because mm -hmm. if you feel like you already feel shameful and you're like I don't know right but you're like I'm shameful so I can't ask yeah so yeah like and especially here in the U.S., because we don't talk about sex or we only talk about sex in one way, you know, that creates a very narrow lens of what we think sex is. Like sex mm -hmm. is between two people, heterosexual, white, young, able-bodied, attractive, mm -hmm. all these things that most people are not. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
right? So when you think about like, you know, what sex looks like or should be, and you mm-hmm. don't see yourself represented, you don't have the education. I mean, me personally, I was asking my friends who are my age for sex advice. I'm like, <laughs> you're doing the thing. How's that going? And they're like, it's going great. Yeah. And then when the next day, like, it's going bad. It's going oh, yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so like that is a pivotal age to Mm. talk about sex Mm -hmm. but also I feel like it is such a large topic you can't start Mm. at that age and I have a friend whose child goes to a Montessori school Mm -hmm. I think that's how you pronounce it wow it sounds fancy (laughs) yeah right so it's not a public school and then she's like they're in third grade and they're starting now because they like sent home a letter and told them like we're doing sex ed everyone started like freaking out she said but then they like they broke it down. They're like, we're calling it sex ed, but it's like, you know, it's health class and it's going to build up through the years mm. to getting to sex. But like, um, we're not <laughs> like, oh, you're eight. Let me tell you something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> boy, oh boy. Are you going to be shocked when you hear this? <laughs> right. So yes, I believe in sex through the lifespan. Mm. And because we wait until like those teenage years, we try to cram it in. And then most people don't continue to educate themselves about sex. Mm. And it's funny, like you said, like you recognize your sex that was trash. I too Mm -hmm. recognize my sex that was (laughs) trash. I feel like most people you ask will say that. They're like, oh, it was bad. And I ask them, so knowing that it was bad or not what you wanted, what have you done in the years after to continue to educate yourself? And they're like, "Uh, uh, oh, such a point. So I'm just like, sex ed shouldn't start or end in high school. Like it's something that we have to keep talking about and, you know, doing the sex ed and the sex, you know, both. (laughs) That's what you're into. (laughs) Because like, as our bodies change, like sex will change as well. Like I was talking to some men that I was thinking about recording for my web series Mm -hmm. and I didn't record this man because he didn't want to be on camera saying this, but he's just like, no one told him what sex is like over 55. Wow. And then he's just like, when he got there, like how his sex drive. So he's just like, he's married to a woman and he's like, her sex drive in her fifties is like, woo. And he's just like, I just like laying in bed and rubbing her butt. He's just like, my sex (laughs) That sounds nice too though. (laughs) That sounds just like, you're married. I'm not going to say nothing, but like, I'm down for the cause. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But he's just like, no one talks about what happens when your sex drive dips, like as a man, because that doesn't happen to men. But it's like, like, no, your testosterone levels go down. Like that does happen to men. Literally. Like it's like, it's scientific. But he's like, I've never heard anyone talk about it. So he's like, I'm not going to be the first person to bring it up because nope. he's just like because no one wants to feed that person like you're in yeah. the room and you say the thing you hear like the record scratch, scratch and right. like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like yeah so you guys can't get hard either am i right in the group chat and they're like block <laughs> right right he's like i don't want to be that person so i never brought it up but he's just like he's like his wife reassures him and she's like it's okay and everything but he's like he feels away and he has no one to talk to about it. And he's like, it makes him feel alone. Mm. Right. And so it's just like, we have to keep learning mm-hmm. about sex. And for all these people out here saying that they're good at it, I'm just like, what are you doing to be good at it? <laughs> like, oh, I didn't know you were certified in sex education too. Right? Sir, who claims to be so good at sex? Right. I need receipts. Like yes. I know what I do to say up on things. What are you doing? Show me the degrees, honey. Right. And it was like, oh, I just do the thing. It's just like, but yes, that doesn't mean you're Gosh. good at it either. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so I'm I'm so curious because you know, you just opened my mind to like a a an idea of introducing sex education as health education from a a young start. And Mm -hmm. I met this baby. I know that sounds obscure, but I met a baby. (laughs) Yeah. She's just walking out. She was at like a summer lake party. And I was like, I'm going to talk to this fucking baby. What up baby. (laughs) 
<laughs> and she is in her bathing suit and she starts telling me about her vagina and her labia. And this is the labia. Mano- and this is a baby. And I was like, how do you know this? And she had two dads, gay, gay fathers, mm-hmm. who bought her this like child book that taught her. And it was like their bedtime story. And they made it so conversational with her. And I was like, let me see this book. So her dads go into the lake house and they get this book out and I'm reading it. And I'm just like, I felt this awful feeling at first. And then I realized like, she's pointing out this thing and this is the anatomy (laughs) here. And this is what the period does. And the woman Mm -hmm. drops the egg. And I was like, this baby knows more about her own body than I do. (laughs) And I've got 30 years on her. How is that possible? Like. I just could not believe, but how, how smart and how happy Mm -hmm. she, she made me feel about the future of sex education. And even just what you talked about, like consent at any age. And I know that's a subject you teach about. Can you tell me like, what does that information actually look like? And how do you make it appealing and make sense to (laughs) (laughs) five-year-olds? Sure. Yes. Shout out to that baby. I feel like <laughs> you should have her on the podcast next. I'm just saying. <laughs> Shout out to that baby. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But we talk about consent, especially um, for people that are our age and a little bit younger. We only know it in the context of sex, right? Mm-hmm. Which makes it hard for a lot of people to understand because they don't even really understand sex itself mm-hmm. so now there's these two concepts they don't know much about and like you know people are like oh I didn't know I could say no or I said I want to do it and then when I changed my mind it's like I already said yes mm-hmm. so like teaching it from a young age and taking sex out of it mm-hmm. makes it a lot easier like I believe in like layering so it's like, okay we we I t- we talk consent you know what it is. Now that you know that and you in it's down pat, let me add a little something else and just keep on doing it, like keep on adding things on top of each other. Yeah. And then just, you know, that helps with yeah. um, education. I feel like it could be overwhelming mm-hmm. when you talk about like, cause I've also had curriculums where it's just like, okay, you have one week and every day, like first day consent, second day, like, you know, body parts and that's like for five days and I feel bad but you know I was getting paid I'm just like (laughs) okay I'm back for four more hours of something you've never heard of (laughs) and they're like oh my god um yeah (laughs) so just like especially with like young kids like teaching them like okay if you have a friend and they don't want to hug you that doesn't mean they don't care about you but they might not, that might not feel good to them. And I'm like, yeah. what feels good to you? Or like, <gasps> do you have a sibling that like to tease you or pull your hair? They might love you and care about you, but that doesn't feel good. So, you know, just understanding like boundaries are a big thing. So like explaining yes. boundaries, little kids are pretty good with boundaries. Like kids have yeah. no issue saying no. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say, they're probably like, I said no. They say that all the time. No oh, means no. They yes. So they under, let us say, they, they understand boundaries. They understand consent to an extent. It's just like adding the other parts into it so they can like grasp the entire concept. The kids mm. love saying no. Mm. I, was, I was like, why don't you want to do it? I don't want to. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. That is consent. I don't want to do this. It doesn't feel good. Mm. Right. Yes. So just taking what they, their natural inclinations and adding a little bit of education can help them understand what consent is at a very young age. And it's like, especially like little people that identify as like little girls, but even like anyone, you know, gender non-binary, it's just like, keep that same energy. Cause yes. a lot of people I meet that are women have a hard time saying no. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. don't let that go. If it doesn't, mm-hmm. if it's not a full body enthusiastic, mm-hmm. yes, don't mm-hmm. do that shit. Mm-hmm. And it is okay. And the person will get over it. And if mm-hmm. they don't, you shouldn't be around them anyway. <laughs> I fucking love that quote. Like if it is not a resounding yes, it's a fucking no. And I didn't, I didn't, I, I Okay. So shifting from children to Mm -hmm. more like teenagers, high school, Mm -hmm. middle school, that age, I 
wasn't confident in myself enough to say like, yeah, you're like confidence. Who is she? Not at that age. <laughs> like I was not, I was so worried about being liked and like mm-hmm. hooking up with a guy and I'm making air quotes, losing my virginity. I was such a late bloomer. We know that virginity cannot be taken into something that you give away and it is your power, honey. It is, there's so <laughs> many things that I know now that no fucking mm-hmm. way when I was 15, I could have like grasped or or bothered to like care about I guess Mm -hmm. and I'm curious like when you're teaching people of that age group when it's already so hormonal and so intense Mm -hmm. and like everything's dramatic but also again like (laughs) that that's the time where you can make a mistake or do something that could change the alter the course of your life Mm -hmm. how do you also teach about pleasure or do you? Shout out to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. My confidants, you guys know I have recently been going through just an absolute, just wild mental health re uptick, refresh. And I would not have been able to do that without my counselor, who I love at BetterHelp. What's interfering with your happiness? What's preventing you from achieving your goals? I personally knew I had this ketamine therapy journey starting soon and I was so nervous and I needed that person, that third party, that doctor who knew what they were talking about to help me get prepared for that environment as well as reintegrate all of things I've learned back into my daily life. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling and better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating with them in under 24 hours. There are licensed professionals and counselors who are specialized in areas such as self-esteem. Oh, who doesn't need it? Grief. Oh God, things are so hard. LGBT matters. So gay. Family conflicts. Mom and anger. And depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, and trauma. Anything you share is confidential. It's convenient, professional, and affordable. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting counselors in all additional 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash CI. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash CI. I do. It always Ooh. results in lots of giggling. <laughs> I'm giggling already. I'm like, yee, tell me. <laughs> But like the same thing you said, like virginity is not something to be taken. It's something that you give, you know, mm. when you want to give it. So mm. I like to tell people sex is not something that is done to you. It's something mm. you do with yourself or other people or people, you know, right? Multiple. That's <laughs> Multiple my favorite people. kind. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that is what you're into. That is fine as well. Once you're taking safer sex practices, you know, and I do explain like, you know, safe safer safest it's like unless it's Mm. masturbation anything you do has some sort of risk involved in it it's just you know there's levels to this it's a a spectrum of risk right but unless you're having sex with yourself no matter what you do with another person there could be some risk to it Mm. but I know in my high school a lot of um of the girls were having anal sex because they're like oh, that is not wow. real that's not real sex. really that's sex not, yeah yes that's like it's not in the vagina yeah and I'm just like <laughs> that's when we still thought sex was like between a penis and a vagina and right insertion right <laughs> I'm just like that doesn't seem fun either but this yeah. is me my like young brain I'm just right. like between the two that was the choice okay I'm not judging yeah not even <laughs> have, a judge not a judge I have questions I'm not gonna judge but yes like <laughs> when you're at that young teenage age where everything is dramatic yes. everything's the end of the world oh yes. my god you know um just like reminding them that this is not something that you one you don't have to do it right Mm -hmm. two you don't have to talk about like when people are having that conversation it's okay to stay quiet like silence is a thing and I feel like at with teenagers they want to feel included like no one wants to feel like an outcast they want to be part of the group and like I've heard a lot of young folks saying like oh well they were talking about it so I felt like I had to chime in I was Mm -hmm. like if you didn't talk what would happen (laughs) 
we can't that. we can't wrap our brains around that in that moment right it's right. too much i don't know fear shame adrenaline mm -hmm. yes yeah. all of those feelings that just come bubbling up for other reasons like that comes up for like the clothes that they buy and the phones that they have so yeah. only imagine what it feels like for something for them that is as monumental as 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 yeah. sex and then also i'm just like sex is only as important as you make it exactly <laughs> that's such a good point yeah and just and they're like but everyone's telling me i'm just like yeah but what does it mean to you some people are just like sex is a thing i do with my body sometimes with some people <laughs> you know i'm just like i was like i'm here to tell them I was like, i'm here to make sure you have the information to make informed decisions and to make the decision that feels right for you whatever that decision is mm. but it's just like reminding them that they hold the power mm in this situation because even like primarily when i teach young folks they still split them up by gender which yeah. is a whole that which yeah. is a mess a whole right a whole nother issue um but schools are just hell bent on doing this and there's yeah. very few schools maybe like one that i've been to where it was something different but they always split them up yeah. by gender and i realized when i talk to people that identify as boys they're, they are also having issues, but it's different, mm -hmm. right? Bet. Right. So like with young girls, they feel like shame from their friends and then mm -hmm. also from the people they want to have sex with. Mm -hmm. Boys don't really care about what the girls think. It's just like their friends. Right? Uh, I have been saying that since high school, that boys are fucking for other boys. The things men do for other men. I'm, just that, like, I'm like, are you guys okay? <laughs> Cause right. I'm like, you're not trying to impress me. They're like, this is not about you, bitch. You, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, they okay. Give a cool. shit less what girls think. They don't care. The rumors they start, they don't give a fuck. Like okay. they did not care. And you're so right. Women have to worry about ourselves, our friends. And it, there's much more of a pressure from right. all spec, all the spectrum about right. how we do it and don't right. do it or how often we do it. And everybody else. Right. So like when I have these conversations, like I could be having two conversations about the same topic, but like we just kind of veer off into different ways. Mm. So like you have young girls, it's like society, boys, friends, mm. family. Sometimes you add in religion, sometimes you add in sexuality. Mm. And it's just like it's a lot of, you know, a lot of things to unpack and unlearn. And that takes time. And I don't think yeah. people give themselves credit we go like on instagram and we see like unlearn you know yeah <laughs> I, I use that word redefine i love but that. that takes time and that yeah. takes you know effort and energy and right. i don't think a lot of people give themselves the space to do that right like recognizing like you might have been taught something that doesn't work for you mm -hmm. and that is okay so mm -hmm. let you know take that time to let it go and let the shame go and then learn what is does will work for you mm. and like what you want to use moving forward through your lifespan mm. damn and I, yeah and even like as teenagers the things that they come to my class with I'm like where did you learn this and how old are you like how did you learn this already I'm just like what is happening <laughs> is it like a good where did you learn this or like this is so wrong where did you learn this depends on the day you know depends on the day <laughs> Sometimes I'm just like, yes, TikTok yes. is teaching you things. Oh, yes. Like, yeah, like sex at TikTok. Like so, there's some good yes. stuff on there. I'm so glad you brought that up. And in other places, I'm just like, who told you that? Because I feel like I need to talk to them. Now I have to fight them for you. So I'm just like, right. why are you telling people this? Why are you telling right. young people this? Mm, yeah, it so. really does. It, it The media influences us so deeply in regard to sex not just like social media but what we see in movies or like you know what religion you even brought up and society mm -hmm. and i keep going back to this question and i hope it's not inappropriate but like the age of of uh i guess is it what consent for most states is 18 there's some that are uh a, a little bit younger 16 15 i think but i i don't think i observed sex with a partner as a pleasurable experience until I was over 18. Like 
it was something that I just had done to me and I would talk about it with the, the friends at school and it was, you know, gossiped about it and that was it. It was never like, it took a lot of redefining sex to be pleasurable. And like you said, like, what does it mean to you for some people? Like, I'm asking you too many questions, but like, should we be teaching teens under 18 that sex is a pleasurable experience or for pleasure? Yes, of course. And I always start off like, people have sex for different reasons mm. right because some and I was like and there's some people who don't like ha- like there's people who are asexual and that's also a mm. spectrum but they don't have the urge to have sex mm. and like that is okay like having sex is fine not having sex is also fine mm. but if you are having sex and you're choosing to do that don't you want the most out of it like if you're mm. doing this act if you do anything I hope it brings you joy <laughs> <laughs> right and that's just everything in life. We all hate doing things that we don't want to do. Right, so right. why are we doing something with our bodies that doesn't feel good? Right. Which goes back to consent. When I talk to like the little kids, like that, if it doesn't feel good in your body, then it's like, mm. that is your body's way of telling you, like, I don't like pain is your body's way of telling you there's an issue or a problem, mm-hmm. anger, fear. And these are all emotions that people put down right yeah. and like especially anger yeah. anger has its time and its place right but when you get angry that means someone has crossed a boundary that you right. did not like and that's your body your brain's way of telling you hey like something has happened that we do not like and mm. you and you get upset and you get angry mm. so I'm, I like to talk about the mental component of Mm. sex as well because you know it starts in between the brain attraction starts because you look at someone and your brain's just like hello I (laughs) I want to sit on that (laughs) yes I want to touch you in your you know your special places right so it's like it starts in the brain so like don't ever you know take that part out of it if you know if your brain is telling you like oh this Mm. doesn't feel good this might not be the person or like, you know, I want something more, then you should go and look for that and get that. And pleasure is part of that, you know? Mm. Mm. Like all the work that I do, the goal is pleasure, right? Mm. Cause like, like I said, if we're doing this, what are we doing it for? Right. Right. Like I do a lot of work with like health equity and like making Mm. sure people have the things that they need Mm. to survive and to have a good life right Mm. so even like if I do work surrounding like housing Mm. if you're not worried about where you're going to live you can focus on bringing more pleasure Mm. into your life because that weight has been lifted off your shoulders and you can use that brain space for something else and more fun yeah (laughs) right right your survival bells are a little quieter and you yes (laughs) focus on other areas of your life. And, and I'm so curious more about sort of that health equity. I think that's God, such an important thing that nobody freaking talks about. And, and we're not addressing those, the, the mental health issue, uh, uh, part of it too. Like we, how do you teach in, uh, say shelters or how do you educate when you're now working with a set of completely different circumstances and life experiences and, and mental health, you know, uh, trauma. Right. And yes, like, so even though I'm teaching, like I'm teaching the same subject is different because the people Mm. that I work with is Mm. different. So every time I teach, it feels a little bit Mm. different to me, but I always start with the emotional aspect. I start like, how are you feeling in this moment? Mm. Because that will really like, first it dictates how the conversation I'm going to have with them is going. Like if they're not in a certain, you know, Mm. headspace, maybe I switch it up a little bit. I'm still teaching, but just change the approach Mm. a little bit. Cause I feel like everyone deserves to learn about sex Mm. and pleasure and what that looks like for them, but also acknowledging that we're coming from different places, from different life experiences. Mm -hmm. And you should really tailor what you're teaching to the person you're teaching to. Like in public health, we all say, meet people where they're at. 
don't come in like I'm teaching this catch up <laughs> like get with it or get lost right, okay right. I'm talking about this today right like good luck <laughs> right write this down right and first of all, like where are you at and how can I meet you with the education that I have mm. Right. And when I was ta- um, teaching in shelters, I was teaching in teen shelters. Oh, wow. And that looked like very different right. for me because mm. recognizing I'm in a shelter with all genders mm. and that a lot of them were doing things because the people that work there were not paying attention. Mm. So just like talking to them and they're like, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. Mm. And I'm just, you know, yeah. And I'm like, okay, um, how do you feel about it? Like, how did you get involved? Like, mm. why? I, I ask them a lot, those questions that really stumps them. And mm. why are you having sex? Mm. Right? Oh. Just the why. Yeah. Like, if you tell me because it feels good, cool. Yeah. But most teenagers, that's not the answer. No. When I ask like them yeah. why they're having sex. And I'm just like, and that is the biggest issue. And that's where I start. Mm. Because if you know, I always like to start with the why. When you think about a flower, that is the root, right? Mm. So yes, the flower is pretty, but the root is rotten, Oof. you know? So start with the why. Why are you doing this? Mm. And then I kind of tailor or like move the conversation from that. But that's always my starting point. That's so beautiful. And you had me questioning my, <laughs> like what my answer was at various points in my life. And oh yeah, like so much of what you do sounds very like therapeutic in a sense, you know, it's like, you're not getting paid the therapy hours. You're getting paid like the <laughs> educator professor hours. Um, and I, I wondered, you know, with what you do, have you ever come across a tough situation where you found out information about someone like that had happened to them in their past, or maybe, you know, with a family member or something traumatic sexually in their past that, you know, you basically have to have taught is not right. Right. Like maybe, you know, they didn't get to come to your consent class when they were (laughs) five or they didn't get the book. Like, how do you handle those situations when you're confronted with like something kind of fucked up? Um, it's kind of like, you just said something like, oh, it's kind of like therapy, right? Mm -hmm. So I have friends who are sex therapists and a lot of people think what we do is interchangeable. I Mm -hmm. see it as us working hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. So what I do, like when I teach, like I, you know, I broach the subject and I talk about it as much as I can with the education that I can, Mm -hmm. but there are people whose job is to do that all Mm -hmm. the time. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so if I'm speaking with someone and I've had multiple situations, especially talking with teenagers, Mm -hmm. with teenagers, I always start off like I'm a mandatory recorder, which Mm. means if I hear if they tell me something that is illegal. Right. I have to tell the police. That is just wow. how it is. That's the work that I do. Wow. So I always lead with that because I don't want them to feel ambushed or like I lied to them. I'm letting you know now. <laughs> yeah. Like this is part of my job. So what you tell me here, if it's something that is to, you know, your detriment, mm-hmm. I have to tell someone that can help you. That wow. is not me. Holy yeah. shit. So even like talking about that consent um, yeah. in Pennsylvania, I believe the age of consent is 16, uh, but there's like a three year buffer, right? Uh, so yeah. like you can have sex at 16 with someone that's 16, 16 17, 18, 19. Mm-hmm. But if they're 20, then there's you can't consent at 16 to have sex with a 20 year old. Got it. Right. So that's why I always preface the conversation, letting them know I'm a mandatory reporter because a lot of young girls yep. are dating, you know, older guys, not realizing that what they're doing is illegal right. and not realizing that it's illegal for a reason, because at 16, if they're 24, mentally, you're not the same. You're not at the same place. Right. And that's a, that's a conversation that I remember was a hot topic where I came from in the South, where (laughs) girls got married very young. They got pregnant very young. You know, there was like a a guy who got 
basically kicked out. I grew up in like a Southern Baptist church, which I have Ooh. left from. Yeah. Like <laughs> coming out of your head, like can still recite all the books of the Bible very far from it now. <laughs> but there was a guy who basically his whole family and he got ostracized and kicked out of the church because he was charged with statutory rape for being, I think 18 and his girlfriend was 17 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there was so much debate of like, how do we scientifically know that that is the age and the front lobe isn't even developed until we're 25 and 27 for men and women. So like, mm -hmm. what the fuck, who, I, like, how do you feel about that age? <laughs> the whole, about, yeah, the, the rule, whole, yeah, <laughs> the whole thing. I need you to give me the whole run of the gamut. <laughs> Yes, like you're right, like our frontal cortex is not fully developed till we're like 25, but also if you are 15, 16, I always like ask, I mean, no matter what the gender, I'm just like, if you have an older like partner, mm -hmm. and I was like, what do y'all talk about? Like, let's start there. <laughs> like, because if you say, no, this is bad, don't do this, they will shut down, stop listening to you. They're like, you're crazy. I'm in love. Get yes. away from me. Yeah. Right. But I just kind of ask questions like, oh, so what do y'all do? What do y'all talk about? Oh, do y'all go out? Oh, no, you stay in the house. Why don't you go out? Do you, like, do you want to go out? Oh, you want to go on dates. Why can't you go out on dates? People give you funny looks and just kind of like, mm. I ask questions that help them start to think mm. about their relationship. Because if you just mm. come out, I mean, Kids, adults, if you say no with no explanation, shoot, we have seen <laughs> through this pandemic, if you say no with the explanation, people- <laughs> They're still gonna deny. <laughs> they're like, you're wrong. You're like- You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I just start asking questions about their relationship, not even the sexual part, just mm. about the relationship. Mm. It's just like, oh, like, how do you feel about men your age or like women mm. your age? Because mm. I've definitely talked to young boys that have had older girlfriends. Mm. I'm just like, what do you have in common other than the physical? Like, so do you think it's a good idea to be with someone that you have nothing in common with other than this act? Mm. You know? Wow. Because I was like, you wouldn't date someone your own age, mm. you know? If, if that was the reason. So why is it that because they're older, you know, man, so. your job sounds so much like, to me, it sounds so much like diffusing a bomb at all times, but to you, it really sounds like even with your metaphor of like building a garden and like these beautiful flowers. And I think like, you've also just shown me how much, and I, I know I can say this for all the listeners too, like how amazing what you are doing is for teens, for kids, for it, it, people in shelters, people experiencing homelessness, uh, older folks, people in a corporate setting. Like I am so in awe of what you do. And I literally just looked up at the clock and I was like, what the fuck? How did the time go by so quickly? I only got through like half of my questions, but I feel like that was such a valuable important thing to hear because I, you've, you've got me revisiting a lot of my teenage years, wishing I had someone as cool as you, like not Miss Lafredo, my sixth grade teacher forget that I couldn't trust or wouldn't listen to at all. Um, but I'd love to know, like, where can the confidants learn more about what you do? How can they get involved in supporting you or, uh, like help change the way things are taught around their area in school, college, all the above. If you want to make a change, I feel always start with the people closest to you, mm. especially now in the world that we live in. We think we're not making a change if we're not making this big mm. public mm -hmm. statement, whether that's mm -hmm. in person, on social media. If, I, like, if you tweet something with a thousand re or 10,000 retweets, <laughs> like, yes, but also sometimes just being, I'm that friend. When my friends want to talk about sex, they find me. Yeah. How about you be that friend for your friend group or be that friend or that person, that auntie, cousin, whoever, whatever, to the people in your family, mm. right? Start yeah. with the people that you know and the people that are closest to you. And that also, because it's a ripple effect, right? Mm. So if you start with people closest to you, you don't know what impact, like 
that would really make mm-hmm. right so right. if you talk to like your cousin about something especially like younger kids they're going to go to yeah. school and tell their friends right so don't think that you have to you know filibuster write a <laughs> petition you know just you know ask at I don't know the next holiday yeah. like hey what you doing how you yeah. doing let's yeah. talk about it come sit next to me yeah. you know So start that, start where you're at, start with the people closest to you. Mm -hmm. And that is probably make a bigger impact than you even realize. Mm. I don't even like have to ask why you do what you do. Like you gave it (laughs) to me this whole episode. I'm like, oh yeah, do I want to talk to people? Like I want to be the cool cousin. I want to do what you do. Yes, and you can. And do you have any resources to recommend or websites or, or places to visit for people that are maybe interested in learning more about being a sex educator? I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, where did you like? Where did you go to learn about it? About being a sex educator. Yeah. So I have my undergrad degree in public health, but I taught by doing. Right. Wow. Because there is no actually, there's no real regulation on who can teach sex ed. So I have a degree, like a in like health. Yeah. But I don't, right. There's only, there's not, you can get a certificate in sex ed, but there's no like undergrad degree in sex right. ed. There's graduate and there's PhDs. So there's always that route. Sure. But yeah, just, I went to school. I know people who did women's studies that teach sex ed. Right. And I think it's always interesting when I meet people that do sex ed, because because it, there is no like undergrad degree for it. People come from so many different mm. like mm. avenues mm. and they educate themselves and they, you know, find part-time jobs, which leads to full-time jobs. And, you know, it goes from there, but people come from so many different ways. And like, you know, right. I know people yeah. that only talk about like purity culture or oh. like people that only <laughs> talk about kids. Right. Right. Wow. Like, oh, I was a parent. I couldn't find what I was looking for. I became the person wow. that parents can come to, to talk wow. about these things. So let's say you, this, what you're doing at your podcast, this is sex ed. It doesn't ah. have to look. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I have now, you know, great Bestowed you upon me. Yes. An honorary day <laughs> of being a sex educator. <laughs> yes. A little graduation hat. Thank what you. you're doing is sex ed. It doesn't have to look the way I'm doing it. It doesn't look the way anyone is doing it. Mm. Once you know, you know your stuff, keep doing what you're doing. Mm. Mm. Okay. (laughs) Last question. Have you ever put a condom on a banana? That's your last question. (laughs) That's my last question. Have you ever done the in front of a a group of young guys? Okay. (laughs) Very begrudgingly, but yes. And I have rolled it down. I, you oh know, my like, gosh. I tell them if it looks like a sombrero, then it's right. <laughs> you know, it should roll down smoothly. If it looks like a baby bottle cap, that means it's inside out. You know, I've done the whole thing. I've never heard that. And that would have been very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Maybe it's not as bad of an example as I thought in my head. <laughs> yes, well, but your confidants can find me at my website, which is janellebryan.com, on Instagram at underscore J, by the way. And for the web series, it is um, at sex redefined. And the website is sexredefinedseries.com. You beat me to it, you absolute professional. You plugged <laughs> right there. But of course, you're a professor. Why wouldn't you be? Um, Janelle, thank you so much. All of those links that she just mentioned will be linked in the description below. Copy it on. And go out there and talk about sex with someone you know it loves. And please.